right, guys, I'm Daniela. This is going to be a fun talk. Um, I do apologize if you guys uh, were expecting a mathematical introduction to category theory. This is not it. Um, so we're going to have fun. Um, there's going to be code because I'm not a mathematician. I code for living, and that's what I love. Um, don't worry too much about the code. It's going to be online. Try to follow the journey that we are going to have. But first, a quick question. Who has done or is able to read a little bit of Scala code? OK, cool, perfect. Most everybody, cool. This is not going to be a disaster then. Awesome. So, um, um, so why am I talking about this stuff? Um, so when I was at uni, um, functional programming wasn't popular at all. It did exist, but nobody was talking about it. Uh, there was a course on Lambda Calculus, but the teacher was kind of tough at grading. It was optional. I didn't take it. Um, so when I started my career, object-oriented programming was the answer. There was nothing else out there. And the rule was gang of four, know all the patterns by heart, and that's it, right? And then I started doing Scala and functional programming in general, and uh, it, was, it was tough. Uh, so I really wish uh, I was a mathematician, but I'm not. Right, and I say that uh, in a good way, right? Because every time I love functional programming, right? But every time I go to a conference or I talk to people, uh, they start mentioning some terms, and I'm like, um, okay. Um, so I, I, the initial impact is quite tough, but the good news is that it gets better, right? So. Because of my background, and I would assume the is the same background of uh, many of you guys, when I see a formula, it's fine, but I don't get it. Um, I will look at it again, and I will probably still not get it. And maybe I'll like the fourth or fifth time, I will finally get it, but that's not how my brain works. My brain first looks for a metaphor. It's just how I have been trying to think of. So I'm going to give you my view on category theory and why it's super cool for us programmers. And I'm going to try to explain all these concepts in a way that I believe it's understandable for a programmer. OK? So but first of all, uh, you, a, little bit, a little disclaimer. You don't need category theory to write good code. Right? Uh, you can still write really good programs without knowing anything about category theory. And also, you don't need to know category theory to write functional programming. Um, functional programming is kind of simple. Don't use mutability and use pure functions, right? You don't need to know the inside out of category theory to do that. So why am I here? Because it's cool. And when I finally understood, it was awesome. So um, I managed to understand why we were structuring things the way we were. And I believe that my code got better. So that's what I hope I'm going to um, show you today, is that by understanding what's behind, our code can be better uh, than just using the tools. So, the first uh, thing that I would like to talk to you about is uh, why do we care about category theory, right? And um, the first question is how do we reason, right? Because we, 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 we have a brain. How does our brain work? So our brain is, is like a machine, right? And that is exactly what programming is, right? Teaching a machine to do something. Um, so, for example, right? Uh, you guys probably took the tube this morning. So I took, for example, the district line. So I knew that I had to go to the station and then take the district line, then exit, and so on and so forth. But while I was doing that, I wasn't thinking about, OK, I'm going to contract my muscles and move my feet because I have to walk there, right? So even the human brain 
basically does two operations. The first one is splitting the task into smaller tasks. And the second one is to abstract out all the things that don't matter. Because we know how to work, right? We need to think about it. Um, and that is exactly what category theory does, right? So category theory doesn't care about the objects, only cares about the interactions between objects. In the specific is the study of how things compose, okay? And category theory, it's a scary term. Um, so if you don't really like category theory, you could call it arrow theory, right? And that's it. Um, you are gonna soon realize that arrows are the thing that we always talk about. We never talk about the objects, okay? But let's do simple. So what's a category? That is a category. So a category is two objects. What are objects? I'll, I'll comment on that in a second. And something, let's call it arrow, that connects two objects. So we have a clear definition of an arrow, but what is an object? Don't know, it could be anything. It could be a chair, it could be a type, it could be a person, it could be a flower. Mathematicians are really vague on what an object is. It's because they have to do a way tougher job than we have as programmers. Um, but we know that most of the time when we programmers, uh, we use um, category theory, most of the time uh, the objects are types and the arrows are functions. Okay, and we have a few uh, rules that um, will, will drive our game. The first rule is composition. It means that if I have uh, an arrow that goes from A to B and then I have an arrow that goes from, G, uh, from B to C, then I know I can automatically create a new arrow that is called G after F. Okay? Everybody with me so far, yes? Cool. And then um, the other law is that there is an identity law. Identity law means it's an arrow that stars and return at the same point. Okay, and obviously when we compose it, it doesn't, it doesn't really change the result. And the final uh, law of our game is my favorite one, is associativity. I'm um, not gonna read the formula, you guys can read it by yourself, but basically what it means is that the, the black path and the green path are equivalent, okay? Really practical terms. You guys see that we have parentheses? These law basically tell us that we don't care about the parentheses. Why don't we care about parentheses? Because we have better things to do with our life, <laughs> right? Um, a lot of complexity in this way goes away, right? We are abstracting out with things that don't matter. So again, this is our game. We're gonna see it over and over again, and believe it, this is all there is to know about category theory. You have a category, and a category is something that has an identity, composition, and associativity laws, okay? Cool, so this is something that we do all the time as programmers, right? We don't call it category, but we know what it is. So for example, we can define a function that is called size that goes from a string to an int, and then we call define a function bigger than two that goes from an int to a ball. And we know that we can combine those two to create a new function that is called size bigger than two, okay? And obviously, the same is for identity. We can define a function that basically does nothing. Um, so um, let's start a little bit talking about interesting bits. So the simplest categories that you probably guys can think of is the category with only one object. So again, the rules are identity, composition, associativity, and this is a graph. Right? Um, nothing fancy, it's kind of cute. 
Um, yeah, and turns out that um, mathematicians don't call it category with one object because it's too long. They call it monoid. Um, so um, you obviously have rules that can be expressed in mathematical formulas. But hey, we are not mathematicians, so for us, rules are just tests that we can write. Okay, so you can. Uh, it's intentionally small. Uh, you guys cannot probably read it, but the idea is that you can translate these mathematical formulas in property-based tests that will basically guarantee that for every implementation of a monoid that you create, the mathematicians will be happy, okay? It doesn't matter what they are, right? They did all the proofs. Um, we trust them. Um, but let's see a little bit of a practical example of why we care about what a monoid is, right? So, um, so let's assume that we choose uh, a definition of composition. For example, we define that composition is the operation sum. And we want to represent uh, the arrows as integers. We can then pick an identity. In our case, it would be a zero, right? So um, the identity law is respected because no matter what we do with the arrow zero, when we compose it with another arrow, we're still going to receive the same arrow back. And composition. Uh, is the way we can create new arrows. So, for example, let's assume I want to create a new arrow and let's call this arrow four. What I could do is take arrow three, take arrow one, compose them together, and voila, I have a new arrow. Let's assume I want to do it with five, right? Uh, we are going to take the arrow four and arrow one and compose them together. So this is a really simple representation on all the possible natural numbers that we can have in our program. And this is cool, but we like to express this in code, right? That's what we are interested in. So in Scala, we have the concept of type class. It's just a contract saying that if you want your type to be called, in this case, monoid, you need to show me how to do this. So we said that a monoid has an identity that is just a, a value, and it has the ability of composing things together. In this case, it means that giving two instances of my type, I can produce one. Okay? This is normal Scala code uh, that you would write every day. You're not using any rocket science feature of the language. And you can probably do that in other languages as well. I know you can do it in JavaScript, so it must be, must be possible in many others. Um, so this is an example of an implementation of a monoid for int, where compose is just the operation sum, and the identity is the um, integer zero. We can obviously do that for many types. Another example is, for example, string, where you can pick the composition has the concatenation of strings and the identity has the empty string. Okay? Everybody with me so far. Cool. And now let's start with the funny bit. Oh man, I love this part. Um, category with one object, right? With more than one object. So far we have seen monoid is category with only one object. But obviously, things are a little bit more complex than that. What happens if you have more than one object? So for example, this is a category with two objects, a flower and a triangle. And we have arrows between them, and we have identity arrows, right? But what happens if we put them in a box? You guys probably have seen these little magic toys that we receive in the welcome pack. Basically, that's it. So you take your flower and you put it in this little box. You take your triangle and you put it in this little box. And you map the arrows that you have in the original category into the new category that you just created, right? And exactly like these toys, 
You can look inside, but you cannot open them. You can change the content somehow, but that's all you can do. So how would you represent this? Again, we need to represent two concepts. The idea of putting the original objects into a box, whatever that means, and we need to map all the errors of the original category into the new category. Um, another way of looking at this is saying, I'm gonna add some context to my original category. Meaning that, okay, I have my data, but now I wanna give you some extra information about my data. For example, box could be, be careful, the data might or might not be there. Or, you know, I could give you zero more examples of this data. Or, this data could explode any second. Right? And in Scala, we do this all the time. So we have option that in our analogy will be a box that might or might not contain a value, we have list that might contain zero more values. We have try that it's something terrible, the first exceptions. We have future that it's a box that is gonna take a while to be completed, and so on and so forth. But you know, mathematicians, they don't call it category in a box. They call it factor. And as usual, we have rules. Notice the rules are always the same, identity, composition, associativity. The formulas get a little bit more complex, but I, th I think we can still manage. Um, so what I've done is that I copied all those formulas and I've translated them in property-based testing, where the tests will verify that the laws are respected, okay? Um, but if you wish, you could see this problem from a different angle. You could see, well, if I know how to transform a flower into a triangle, and I have a box of a flower, then I must know how to transform the box of a flower into a box of a triangle. Because that, that's the law, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't work, right? Mathematicians told that it's possible. Um, and again, what a functional programmer does is just ask for an implementation with a type class. Um, and that is exactly it. So you can define a type class functor um, that has a function map that takes a box of A and a function that transform an A into a B. Another way of looking at this is that I have my little toy. I just need to transform the content of my toy without opening. So I'm basically applying a function inside of my toy. Okay? Cool. And to show you that this is possible, uh, with many, many languages that have a decent uh, type system, I'm not gonna use the standard option type that we have in Scala. I implemented my own. Uh, so uh, this is just an algebraic data type. You just say that maybe is something that has two possible statuses. Either has some value, just with the value, or is um, empty. If you guys are familiar with our school, this is stolen from you, basically. Um, if you are familiar with Scala, it's just uh, is a sum of a value or none. Okay, it's just to prove that I'm not using any crazy feature of the language. And this is an example um, of an implementation for maybe. The idea is that I have my box and I see if I have an object, if I have a value inside my box, that's great. I just apply the function um, 
to the value that I found in my box. If my box is empty, sorry bro, nothing I can do, I'm just gonna return the box as it is. Okay? That's a functor in category theory. Okay, but let's do something a little bit trickier. What about this equation, right? Because ideally we can put whatever we want in a box, right? Um, so we have a feeling that this could be solved, right? Because we have all the elements. But remember, the only thing that we know how to do so far is how to apply a function into a box. And these kind of situations where you have two boxes that are independent and needs to be somehow combined together, mathematicians call, call it applicative. So it's two boxes that are completely independent and for some reason we want to put them together. And we have a, a few rules, a little bit more than before, but the three amigos are there. Identity, associativity, composition. So all good. And same as before, no need to uh, worry too much about the details. It is possible to translate all these formulas into tests to make sure that we still respect the, the rules of our game. Um, so basically, what we want to express now is the idea of combining values together that are in a box and the idea of once we have our result to put it in a new box. And what a, a functional lazy programmer would do, type class. So uh, this is the definition of applicative in Scala. So you have a function that is pure, that is just puts the value into my container, and then you have a function AP that basically combines the two boxes together. Notice that um, I am extending functor. In terms of Scala, that means that every applicative is also a functor. And I can do that because if I have pure and if I have AP, I can implement map in terms of AP and pure. Okay? But life is not, is not, is not so simple, right? So what happens if Instead of having a function that goes from A to B, I have a function that takes two parameters, right? Well, what do you do? In this case, I'm not talking about two boxes anymore. I'm talking about three boxes. And unfortunately, in Scala, that's the solution. So you create 22 <laughs> functions called AP, AP2, AP3, AP4, AP5, AP6, up to 22 to resolve this kind of problem. Unfortunately, that's a limitation of the Scala compiler. And um, this is an example of a working implementation for our container, um, maybe. So pure is just the constructor. So we just say just A. And for AP, the idea is that you want to see what's inside the boxes, <coughs> If both the boxes contain the values, awesome. Smash them together, apply the function. And there you go, you have, you have what you're looking for. But if any of them is empty, or both of them are empty, sorry bro, nothing we can do. Uh, so we just return the empty box. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Cool, and now the really cool moment. Box in a box. What happens if that happens, right? So we, we have seen what map is. It's the idea of changing the inside of a box. But what happens if the function that I use to, um, to change the content of my box returns a box itself? I would end up with that crazy thing that it's a box in a box. So, so far, the things that we can do is create a new box you take the content of a box and smashing things together, two independent boxes together. We don't know how to squash two boxes, like fuse two boxes together. So 
this is basically a new problem that we need to solve. So how can we move from two little boxes like this to just one box? And believe it or not, take it with a pinch of salt. So if you are a mathematician, that I know, I'm sorry. But this is basically the concept of a monad. Monad is just fusing boxes together, and that's it, right? That, that, that is all. Um, okay, so you have a set of rules again, uh, same as before, because we are still talking about categories. So you have identity, composition, associativity, and we can verify those rules by just writing tests, okay? And we are functional programmers, so we are lazy. Boom, how would you solve the problem? Okay, now you have a type class that is called monad that has a new function that is called flatten. It basically tells me how to solve my problem. That is, how do I transform a box of a box of an A into a box of A? And because this operation of flatting uh, is fairly common, in Scala, we have an alias that we call it flat map. It basically means <coughs> do a map first and then do a flatten. Okay? That's it. Um, so it, for me, it's really weird because um, before studying category theory, I thought that monad was, well, that, that's going to be the awesome bit to learn. But actually, it turns out that the, the interesting bit is actually the functors. The idea of saying, OK, I'm adding metadata on top of my data, that's really cool. Fusing boxes, yes, it's, it's cool, but you know, it's, it's not that cool. But why do we programmers care so much about monads? That's why. So um, this is just, uh, again, what happens if you apply a flat map? Flat map is map, and then you do a flatten. Basically, through a flat map, you can move through a box of A to a box of B. And from a box of B, you can move to a box of C. Basically, what a monad allows us to do is to sequence operation in the same context. So that is extremely useful because if you can think of a program, it's probably we are going to imagine it as a list of things to do, like step one, do this, step two, do that, and so on and so forth. So it's the idea of sequential, sequentiality, putting things in a sequence, OK? And uh, if you know a little bit of Scala, that reminds us of a for comprehension. When we learn Scala, they just show us, uh, they show us uh, that constructor and they just say, don't worry, it works, it's cool. Uh, it's uh, syntax sugar, don't worry. But they don't tell us, hey, that works because we are working with monads. Okay, but we do that all the time. It's like lesson two of learning Scala. Okay. But it turns out that monad is a little bit more than a functor. So if you shuffle things around a little bit, and if you are into ASCO, you probably, you probably know the pain of shuffling things around. Um, so the ASCO community initially implemented monad as functor, but then after a while they realized that it was an applicative. So if you um, are willing to um, change the functions that you leave as undefined, so if you are willing to have pure undefined uh, and flatten undefined, you can implement all the other functions uh, using those two. Uh, and that is super powerful because it means that every monad is also an applicative. Um, so this is an example of a monad for maybe. So Pure is the same of what we have seen before, so it's just the putting a value in the box, so it's just just the way. And flat map is 
Okay, so if I have, if I have um, my container contain something, then I'm just gonna take the value and apply the function. Remember, the function returns a box itself, right? So easy peasy. And if uh, I don't have a value to apply, sorry, there is nothing I can do with it. Okay? So we are almost there. Um, so a little note um, to explain the difference between functor and endofunctor, right? So we have seen the idea of functor has a way of mapping between one category into a new one. So you can see the flowers and triangle, that bit, well, that bit, um, as a category. That is usually called the source category. The box with the flower and the triangle with the flower, that's another category that is called the target category. But if you think about it, we are programmers, right? So with our box, all we are doing is that we are mapping an object type into an object type. And functions are still functions from types, right? So it turns out that um, programmers have a fairly easy job compared to mathematicians. And every time a programmer talks about a functor, it actually talks about endofunctors. Endofunctors means that the source category and the target category are the same. Okay? And now the sentence that scares me for like one year and a half. Monad is monoid in the category of endofunctors. How many people have heard that? Okay, everybody. So this sentence was the whole motivation of me starting uh, studying category theory because uh, everybody was like, oh, it's simple. It's just the monad in the category of the endofunctors. And I couldn't get why. Um, so there are two words alighted in that sentence. It's monoid and the functor. Monoid, we have seen it, right? It's that idea where you have an identity and then you have the ability of squishing things together with a compose. So you give me two elements and I'll give you one back. And the functors, it's basically the same as functors for us. It's just the idea of changing the content of my box without opening. So, if you guys remember, the definition of monad was two functions, pure and flat map. Flat map is just a combination of two, that is map and flatten. So there you go, you have a monoid because you have the identity that is pure and flatten, that is the idea of composing things together. And you have an indefunctor that is because it has a map. Okay? So that is, uh, so if you are a mathematician, probably you, you are gonna be screaming inside. And like, no! Forgive me, but that's, uh, that's a simplification. Uh, but it's a good starting point. Um, Cool, so uh, what we have seen so far, uh, category theory is a mathematical branch that study how things compose. What are things? We don't know, we don't care. Um, monoid is a category that contains only one object, and for us it's extremely useful because, because allows us to reduce things. So it has the idea of given two things, Give me just one. And you probably have seen it around as a way of reducing a data structure into a single element, like reduce a list into maybe just a, an int, okay? And we have seen functor. Functor is the idea of having, modifying certain values into a specific context. A predicative, is the idea of having independent um, 
independent values that are combined together in a context. And monad is just a way of putting things in a sequence. Okay? So I'm going to scare you off a little bit. We just scratched the service. Um, so that is um, a mapping of all the type classes that uh, we have in CAT. There is one of the libraries that implements all these principles. And we have covered four of them. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we still don't know that we have to discover. My latest addition uh, to my to understand list was Profunctor Optics. If you know what they are, please come and find me and explain it to, the, to me because it looks cool, but I don't know why yet. Um, but you're probably going to be a little bit confused, bombarded by a lot of information. If you have to remember something about this presentation, remember that. So what category theory is trying to tell us is forget about the details just reason on how things compose. That is the only thing that matters. And if you guys want to know more, um, those are the main resources that I used uh, while I was uh, starting with category theory. The first one is a talk by Philip Walder uh, that he did the Lambda World. Uh, it's uh, the category theory for the working hacker. It's really cool. It goes through what uh, algebraic data types are, product, co-product. Um, Bartosz uh, did a series of videos on category theory. They are on YouTube, free to watch. They are awesome. He also wrote a lot of blog posts um, that the community has decided to put in a PDF, and the community produced a book on it. And they are really, really cool. Um, if you guys want to have a look at the, um, the mapping of all the type classes that we have in CAT, that's the link. But uh, the first place where I started to learn all of this was in CAT's documentation, the documentation of this library, where they provide really practical examples of how to use all these concepts. So the slides are going to be online on my Twitter account. Uh, so is the code. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Don't be scared. I don't bite. A question could be, I'm going to explain you profunctor optics later at lunch. <laughs> Yes. Yes, sure. Totally naive. So you showed yeah. monads from sequencing. So how do you do concurrency in category theory? So the question is, um, so monads are for sequences. Uh, concurrencies, how do you express that in category theory? Um, the way I would do it is that I, I would just represent it with a particular type of monad. Uh, so yeah, with monads. <laughs> so um, a monad allows you, so the question is, how does a sequence represent, um, represent um, concurrency? So um, of, often what you want to do with concurrency is to um, represent, represent things that run in parallel. So the idea is that um, I would represent each process with a monad. And then because a monad, uh, you can put it um, in sequence, um, I will just uh, use a monad. Oh my god, that's, that's a terrible answer. <laughs> um, I'll, show you, I'll show you an example of stage. But the idea is that monad is the most powerful representation that you have of, for side effects. Uh, so, for example, the IO monad will be ideal, where you can represent your side effect, and when you, at some point, you need to merge everything together, you can use to either do it sequentially or in parallel. But that doesn't answer your question. Uh, 
So I'll have a chat with you off stage uh, during lunch and it's a little bit complex, but yeah, awesome question. Any other question? No? Okay. Thank you very much, guys.